Hello everybody. Okay, what I'm going to talk about today is a bit about inverse functions. I feel that this topic deserves a little more discussion. So this video is a chance for me to get into some of the, the details that maybe I have not brought up in class. So you can also look at this video anytime you want. Go through it at your own pace. Take your time. Make sure you understand this. So what I'm going to do uh, is first I'm just going to discuss what an inverse function is and most of you should already know what that is and I'm simply uh, taking a function and in this case I'm going to look at the example of y equals x squared minus 3 a fairly simple uh, simple function uh, just a little quadratic and so if I'm if I'm going to be changing this to an inverse I think the important thing to know right off the bat is that most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, what you're going to end up when you do an inverse of this function is that you're going to end up with something that's not a function at all. And so you're going to have to do something to work with it. You're going to have to do something to figure out how to, how to, you know, make it, make it work. Now, we all know what an inverse function is if we do it mathematically. All I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, the y's are now x's and the x's are now y's. And so I get something that looks like that. x equals y squared minus 3. Now, um, that's all nice and all, but we want to kind of change it so that it is, once again, in the form of f of x equals some function using x's. So if I did that, I would end up bringing the uh, y equaling and then the 3 would go over and I'd be left with an x plus 3 and then I would square root. Now the important thing to realize is that of course if I square root I have to say plus or minus which immediately uh, presents me with a problem because what that suggests is that with this one x I put in it doesn't really matter what it is I have the possibility of getting two answers. So there's my problem, because right off the bat, the important thing to remember about how inverse function, or actually, sorry, how functions themselves work, is that we have a basic definition that for every x we put in, we have to only get one y, and this is important. Now, how do I fix this problem? Now, there's there's a few ways of fixing it, but what I, what I want to look at here is just, let's just for a moment, just for fun, plug in a few x's into uh, this function and see what we get. So I'm going to I'm gonna just do a few. I'm just going to say negative 2, negative 1, 0. Let's go for 2, maybe 3. So I've got a few. And if we plug them in, let me see. i got uh, 4. Negative 2 will be 4 minus 3. That'll give me a 1. And then a negative 1, that'll be 1 minus 3. That'll be a negative 2. If I put in 0, I'm going to get negative 3. Let me see, what else do I get? Is this right? 4, negative 4, minus, yeah it is. 2, 2 squared, that'll be 4 minus 3, that'll be another 1. And then 3, that'll be, well that'll be uh, 9 minus 3, that's going to be uh, 6. Which is a bit, yeah, everything else is kind of hugging around the middle here. Uh, I guess it's pretty clear that if I did um, a 1 here, I'll squeak it in there. 1, I'm going to get a positive, uh, a negative two also, because it's a quadratic, and I can tell that my my vertex is at is right here. Here's my vertex of that function. So the question is, is uh, okay. So these are my y values for my x's. And so the question is, is what what is um, the x values that I'm using for? Well, sorry, what is the y values if I'm using the same x, the same x? into the inverse function. What kind of y do I get? Now, um, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use my, my function here. This is where it gets a little funny. Okay, so let's see. Let's say I've got a negative 2. Okay, so if I get negative 2 plus 3, that's going to be plus or minus root of 1, which means I've got, well, technically I've got negative 1 and 1. Those are my two possible answers here. Uh, if I put in negative 1, that's going to be a plus or minus. I might as well just simply say plus or minus square root of 2. Starting to see there's a bit of an issue here. If I plug in 0, what do I got? 0 plus 3, I'm going to get plus or minus 
the square root of 3. It's not looking too good for me here. Now, let's, let's for a moment uh, think about another way of looking at this, okay? Now, this here is the y value, the original function. This is the x's that I'm using in the original function. Now, remember, in the inverse function, I can use the same x's, but how do I find out um, how to use them? Now, let's just simply, uh, let's just look for the moment right here at this little thing right here. Now, what is this telling us? This is telling us one thing. It says that f of negative 1 is equal to negative 2. But it's telling me something else. Something else that's already in there. It tells me that if I'm going to look at the inverse function, say f inverse of the y value that I got here, that is now the x value. And I already know what the answer is going to be because I am just simply going to switch the x's and y's, which means I already know that the inverse functions uh, using an x of negative 2 will give me a y value of negative 1. Now that happens to be one of my answers. So this, is, this gets a little funny because I have to say, well, hold on. There is more than just simply negative 1. I've got to consider that. I've got an answer though. I do have an answer. And if I look at this, let me just look at this for a second. I already know this thing here. I'm just going to do that in purple. Because look over there. If I use the x of 1, I get negative 2 right here. So if I plug in, let me see, how can I say that? If I plug in a negative 2, I will get a y value of negative 1. But I got it also by using this here, by just simply going backwards from what I had already got. In other words, if I know, let's look at this one. If I've got f of 0 is equal to negative 3, I also know that f inverse of negative 3 should be equal to 0. Now, we're looking at this only in terms of math and, and a table of values and sometimes this is where we can get a little confused like how where does this come from and also how do I include this whole plus or minus thing up here and when I originally just simply solved for the thing so what I want to do is I just want to look at the function as we graphed it so the black here is my original function here it is x squared minus 3 and what I know is that if I, if I flip it across the line of y equals x, it's going to be this red and blue line. And I'm going to end up with something that's not a function. Now, what did I say before? Let's just look at that now. Let's go back for a moment. I know that f uh, of, say, negative 2 is... Um, now, I'm talking about the inverse function. f of negative 2 is negative 1, and f of negative 3 is 0. Let's, take a, let's go back and look again. So, negative 2, negative 1, and positive 1. Sorry, there's 1, there's negative 1. And f of negative 3 is 0. So, how do I get the... Um, the actual new function. Now, a lot of people, what they do is they say, okay, I've got, I've got to make a line that's going at y equals x, and then I'm trying to find things by flicking, flicking them sort of at 90 degrees to that line. Just to remind you, there's another way of doing this, and for me, sometimes this is easier. Consider that I'm taking y equals x squared minus 3, the black, and I'm doing two things with it. First thing, I am rotating it negative 90 degrees around the origin. So just picture that I've now, say this piece now is turn 90 degrees this way. Or this piece is turn 90 degrees this way. The whole thing has been taken and rotated clockwise. I said negative 90 degrees. So clockwise around the origin. But then when you do that, you also flip it over the x-axis. So that's really what's happening there. 
Now for me, this is just an easier way to look at it. I'm, I'm rotating 90 degrees in the clockwise direction, and then I'm flipping over the x-axis. So, um, for example, if I'm looking at, uh, I don't know, let's just pick a point. If I, if I looked at, say, uh, negative, two, uh, negative 1 and negative 2 right there, right there, I would have rotated it up, and that would have led me up here, but then I would have flipped it over, and it would be at negative 2 comma negative 1. And that's all I'm really doing. Now, you could also just simply grab a bunch of points, flip the x's and y's, and map it out. That's another way of doing it as well. That's going to work fine. Now, what do we do with this? Now, a bit of a clue as to what we have to do comes with the fact that I've colored this in two different colors. It is clear that I have to separate this so that each piece, in other words, I am writing this in piecewise, each piece must have a unique set of y's for all the x's. And it's clear if you look at the red part, there is nowhere where I am getting a second y at any point there. And then the blue part, there's nowhere there. So I could, I could, if I wanted, I could write this in terms of a piecewise function. Let's just go back for a moment. So I could, let me see, I'll just, let's just start fresh. I could say, well, um, I had y equals plus or minus square root of x plus 3. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, this is y equals what? Well, square root of x plus 3 or negative square root of x plus 3. Now, I have to be a little careful about this. Where are these happening? Well, let's go back to that. Let's go look again. Clearly, I am cutting it right here. Now, how do I say that? How do I say that? I, um, now, could I say it happens at x equals negative 3? That's could, but I want to say where this is true. So actually, what's a little weird about this is that I have to give my, my range that I'm going to allow. I'm not talking about the domain. Notice usually when we do piecewise, when you did, say, absolute value function. For example, if I did something like this, um, you would be saying, uh, y equals, uh, for example, y equals this piece. Uh, let's say this is x equals 5. You would say this is for x is greater than or equal to 5. And then um, this piece here, this would be, um, that would be where x is less than 5. And, you, and you, so you would be defining each part, each piece of the function by the domain, the part of the domain where it is true. But not here. Not here, because if you look at this, it would be kind of ridiculous. They're both happening, in fact, for this one, along the same domain. It is ridiculous to sort of define it that way. It is better to look at it in terms of the range. So if I looked at this, I could say, well, it's positive uh, above the x-axis. So I could say it's where y is greater than or equal to 0. And here, I have it where y is less than 0. And that way I've defined my piecewise function. I've got two pieces where the y's that I'm allowed to put in, uh, or the one the y's that I'm allowed to get out, really, is the way to look at it, um, are the ones I can use for that particular function. And remember, that's that y is also the original x value. It's the original x values. Y's, x's are... Let's just look at that again. This is where it gets a little funny, but look at the original function and say, okay, what happens when I flip it is that I get two y's. And where does that come from? Well, it's because the original function, let's just destroy those other, other ones. Look at this. It's where I have two x's for the same y. So right here at y equals 1, I've got an x value of negative 2, and I get an x value of 2. And when I flip it, well, what that tells me is that at x equals 1, I'm going to have a y of negative 2 and a y of 2. And I can't have that. So when you're thinking about this, remember, you're trying to see where on your original graph, where on the original graph, you're having two y's, sorry, two x's, I have my apologies, two x's 
for the same y because that'll get flipped and I'm going to have two y's for the one x. So where do I cut it? Where do I cut it? Well, it's kind of obvious where I'm going to cut it. It's where, it's where I have what is interesting here is where a very strong possibility is going to be where I have a slope of zero. Because if I have something that looks like this, and right here, right there, I have a y prime equal to zero. But notice, I've got something going down, i got something going up. In other words, decreasing and increasing at this point. Then I know I have to cut it here. Because these will overlap each other. I'm going to get this happening. And I will need to cut right there so that these are not on the same function. I'm separating the function so these are not actually part of the same function. I don't have the two y's. So if I have something like this, once again, my slope is zero. But in this case, I've got an increase and decreasing. That means I'm going to have, once again, two x's for the same y. And when I flip it, it's going to be the same thing here. Except it's going to look like this. Same idea, though. Same idea. So what's interesting is that I'm really looking for critical points because I didn't mention this but imagine if I had that this um, okay maybe that's not an, uh, a y prime of zero but it's a y prime that is undefined and potentially potentially is a situation where I once again may have to cut up my function now it's not always going to happen it's not always going to happen because I could have something, for example, let me draw it over here. What about this? Well, I have a y prime equal to zero somewhere in there. But in this case, I went from an increasing to an increasing. And no point is repeating itself. I don't have a situation where I need to cut that up. In fact, this flipped is going to look fine. I don't even have to cut it up at all. Everything will still be unique. So there's a, a bit of analysis that you have to do with inverse functions to really understand where to do it. I hope that helps a little bit. Now I'm going to do another video where I'm just going to look at trigonometric functions. But uh, take a look at this. Make sure some of this makes sense. And realize that you really simply, simply have um, two options here of what you want to look at. Now, you have a choice of either taking your thing as a piecewise function. Let's just list this off. Okay, what can I do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this now again. What about, what about finding the, now let's just look at this. I'm going to just say the derivative of an inverse function what do we do so if you make it into piecewise then then you get then you get a um, f inverse prime x uh, let's just call it one and you're going to get a different one because you've you've separated it. Sorry, I shouldn't draw that. Let me, let me erase that. You're going to get two different functions you got to work with, which means you got to do uh, two derivatives. For example, if I had said I've got y equals, let's go back to our original one. I've got square root of x squared plus 3, and I've got negative uh, square root of x squared plus 3, then I would have to get the derivative of this one and the derivative of that one. That's how I'd have to do it. Now, that's option one. Option two is that I go implicit. That ought to work as well. So in other words, let's say I never uh, altered this around. I just simply said, okay, let me see. I'm going to start with y equals x squared. I will change this now to what? Uh, x equals y squared. And then I will get the derivative of that. So that's kind of interesting because I would get, uh, oh, sorry, that was x squared 
plus the minus three, right? So that would be minus three over there too. So how would I get this? How would I get the derivative of this just by using implicit? I leave that to you to do on your own. I've already gone 20 minutes in this video, so that's as far as I'm going to go. But you should be able to easily make um, a derivative of that and then use that to solve your problem. That's another way of doing it. Okay, we'll go into trigonometry next.